so hopefully you're here to hear somebody, uh, namely me, talk about why the Octo project for my IoT project. Uh, if you are not here for that talk, you're welcome to stick around. I don't want to don't want to bore you with something you don't care about. But if you're in the wrong room, this isn't like an airplane where you're stuck. You're welcome to get up and go to the right talk. But hopefully we're all, we're all here uh, for for talking about the same thing. Uh, I have a mic up here. I would encourage if you have questions as we're going, I'd much rather handle them as we go rather than waiting and batching them up at the end. So just do your best to get my attention. I got the mic up here. I know we're recording in the back, so we'll try to pass the mic around if there's any questions or discussion uh, as we move through the, uh, the presentation. So briefly, what, what the heck are we doing here? Why are we here? So I'm going to start just a little bit uh, with, with some motivation about you know, why, why IoT is interesting and that kind of thing. I suspect for most of us, it's, it's, it'll probably be redundant, but it's always good to kind of start with that level of detail uh, at the beginning. Then we'll dig a little bit into some of the challenges for just general embedded development, for Linux development in general, in, in, in more particular, and even deeper uh, for IoT development. Again, probably a review for a lot of those, give a lot of those in this room, given the, the uh, audience of this show, but uh, still good to, to have it in there, especially since this will be uh, captured for posterity somewhere. Then we're going to describe the basic IoT workflow, kind of a getting started, you know, when you're getting started with an IoT design, what, do you, what the heck do you have to do, and, and, and what are the first five or six big questions you need to ask. Uh, then we'll dig a little bit into an overview of Yocto. Uh, ultimately, that is the, the meat of this presentation. And uh, talk about some of the benefits uh, of both Linux and Yocto as it relates to IoT development. And uh, with that, I kind of wanted to, to, to kind of pull the audience here. Uh, how many in, in here are familiar with and have used Yocto in the past? Okay, so pretty much everybody. Uh, so the, the benefits of Yocto, I probably don't need to sell you guys on unless you're just starting with it. What about IoT development? Okay, so a little bit less than half it looks like. So a, a, decent, uh, a, a decent arrangement of uh, folks. Uh, this isn't really intended to be a deep dive into Yocto or anything like that. Uh, I've got some links at the end for some other talks. Obviously there was quite a few other uh, talks going on at this uh, conference. So if, you, if you're really looking to get real deep into Yocto, this isn't the place for it. Uh, a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Drew Mosley. I currently work uh, on a project called Mender.io. You might have seen our booth upstairs. It's a, an open source project for deploying over-the-air updates to connected embedded Linux devices. Uh, I've been in the embedded Linux uh, development space for about 10 years, uh, focused primarily on Yocto, uh, and then longer than that in general embedded software. Uh, my role lately is more about uh, technical marketing, uh, customer solutions architecture, and that kind of thing. Uh, the Mender project is a completely open source project, uh, and if, if you have the need for some over-the-air updates for your connected devices, we sure would love to, to have you using our product. So as I said, motivation, this is typically the, uh, the business side of things and the, and the links to things like Forbes and uh, various places where they talk about dollars and things like that. Uh, I, I think it's pretty obvious uh, to everyone in this room, uh, our embedded projects are increasingly using Linux. Again, this is the Embedded Linux Conference. Not hard to sell most of the folks here on that. Uh, the, the, the market opportunity, obviously, is, uh, is pretty big. $267 billion by 2020. I think uh, we would all like to have a, at least some portion of that. Um, and, and you know, Linux is uh, a, an extremely big player in that market. Uh, nodes and gateways are estimated at uh, 17, over 17 billion units uh, by 2023. Uh, and that's driven by a lot of things, but uh, the, the, the relative uh, inexpensive uh, hardware that's out there, relative ease which, with, with which you can gather them, uh, things like Raspberry Pi, BeagleBone, I'm sure we're all familiar with. And then uh, production hardware with uh, manufacturers like Tordex, Verisite, Boundary Devices, and then uh, the semiconductor manufacturers uh, are also uh, playing, a, playing a big part in making this available and, and more widespread. So some challenges uh, as embedded, in, in general, as embedded developers, as embedded Linux developers and IoT developers that, that we face compared with uh, uh, typical uh, enterprise or desktop style development. We deal with a wide variety of hardware. Any, on any given day, we, we may have multiple chipsets on our desk. We may, our design may have a, um, a multi-core ARM where it's running Linux. It might also have a single core MCU running an RTOS, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, we, we'll deal with ARM one day, maybe x86, maybe MIPS. So we're, we're kind of all over the place. 
We also have a much wider variety of storage media we have to deal with than is typical in a desktop application. Most of the boards we, we, we deal with in the prototyping space, they generally use SDMMC or just onboard EMMC, but uh, more commonly these days we're seeing raw flash devices, uh, we're seeing SATA devices, uh, there, there's quite a, quite a, a, a range of uh, choices there and each one of them has their own uh, pluses and minuses and challenges with getting images deployed to them, uh, longevity that, and that kind of thing. Um, when we're dealing with embedded Linux, the software we're using uh, may, might not be maintained in the canonical upstream location. A lot of times we have uh, kernels that are maintained by the chipset providers. Uh, eventually the changes will make their way back upstream, but uh, at any given time we might be working with uh, different forks that are, are, are not necessarily the same from project to project. And of course, we're generally speaking dealing with cross-development. We do see some native development where uh, you install just your, your standard desktop class uh, distribution on your board and you actually run your compiler and things like that on the board, but uh, that's generally a pretty painful approach given the performance of most of these devices. And if you're not, uh, if you haven't been in the embedded space for a while and you're not familiar with the workflows involved with cross-development, that can, that can typically be a, a pain point that uh, we want to try to help uh, ease for uh, people coming into the space. And getting the initial images on the device and keeping them updated is, is a constant battle. Every device is, has its own mechanism. If it's an SD card, it's pretty simple. Usually you usually pop the SD card out, you put it in your desktop, you're, you're able to write the image. But if it's got onboard EMMC or raw flash, it's going to have its own mechanism, which is typically going to be uh, unique to the, at least the board vendor. Uh, so you're going to have a different, different provisioning setup that you use uh, for any given device at any given time. So, you're getting started in embedded Linux and IoT development. This is, you know, the first thing you do is you go to the web and you say IoT getting started guide. So this, the, that's what I'm trying to, trying to get at here with the next couple of slides. So the first step, buy and pick your hardware. Obviously, uh, the picture here shows a number of Raspberry Pi devices. I, I think we've all seen those. Uh, there, there's all sorts of uh, selection guides. The, the link at the bottom of the slide here from uh, Make Magazine covers a, a, somewhere between 30 and 3,000 boards, uh, depending on the day you go look at it. The, the, the number of boards that are available uh, is astounding, and, and, there's, and they, they come in a, a wide variety of form factors, uh, certain different amounts of memory, different chipsets. Uh, so there's plenty of, plenty of uh, resources on the web for you to, to start digging into some of these things, but uh, that's the first step. You know, what kind of hardware are you looking at? What, you know, how much power do you need? Do you need uh, display capabilities? Do you need uh, video input capabilities? That kind of thing. Second step is what is your connectivity? Uh, what I'm showing here, this is a uh, Toradex Aster board. Uh, that's their base board. Actually, on the back side of it is their system on module. Uh, so that can be either be an IMX6, IMX7, IMX8. But uh, typical connectivity, especially in early portions of the development, obviously you got your power and Ethernet. Uh, you may have USB. In this case, we have a, an LCD panel connected. Uh, so you look at uh, the connectivity you need for the development side where you're going to need things like JTAG maybe, maybe serial consoles and things like that. And then also the connectivity for the end use of your application, whether it's going to be Wi-Fi, whether it's going to be Zigbee, whether it's going to be you know, any of these new protocols that are coming out. So all of these things uh, you want to start thinking about early on uh, when, when you're putting together your high-level plans for your uh, IoT design. Once you've got the hardware and you've got it connected somewhere in your, in your lab, you need to install the operating system. And generally speaking, in the embedded space, in the embedded Linux space in particular, there's three main ways that you're going to get a, get a target operating system. One is you're going to use a binary, binary distribution. So this is very much like you do in your desktop, laptop, PC. You go to uh, ubuntu.org, you go to debian.org, whatever. You download a binary image. You, you do a write of that using the DD utility or other utilities to your SD card and you boot it and, and you go from there. At that point, you've got a fully, functional, fully functioning system. You can run app, get update, get the latest updates, get the latest kernels, install whatever uh, programming languages you need, that kind of thing. Uh, and it, with a binary distribution like this, it looks very much like you're working on your desktop operating system to begin with. Uh, one, one step removed from that is uh, moving backwards to the build tools that are generally used by the, the distribution folks themselves, things like DE Bootstrap or whatever the, whatever the build tools are that are associated with your distribution of choice. Um, that gives you a little bit more control and a little bit more flexibility as far as having a starting point that you can share from developer to developer. 
uh, but it's not quite the equivalent of what we call a build system, which is where Yocto fits in. Uh, and, and, and the distinction really is with, with things like Yocto and uh, Buildroot, uh, they are, there is no separation in, in, in the developer's mind typically between the build environment and, and the run environment. They're all the same thing, whereas with something like a, an OpenWRT or a Debian, most of your users are going to grab the binary and that's all they're going to work with, and then you have some set of core developers that'll be working on the, the packaging and the build system. But with Yocto, it's all one and the same. And once you have a system up and running, next step, develop and test your application. A lot of details that I'm glossing over in these two bullet points, uh, and that's not really the, 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 the meat of this topic, so I figured I'd kind of put them together. We all know we have to do it, uh, and uh, from, once you have this base system up and running, you have uh, numerous options. We'll touch on a few of them as we go through. And then we want to test the system. Do all the blinky lights come on when you expect them to? Are all the peripherals working the way you want? Is your application running? Do you have the proper network connectivity? Uh, do you have, you've got an Internet of Things device, you might have a fleet of multiple devices, are they communicating with each other as expected? Do you have your cloud infrastructure on the back end aggregating all the data? There's a lot of details, again, that go into that test. Uh, and, and some of that is related to Yocto and some of that's kind of uh, peripheral to it. So we won't dig too deep into that. And finally, deploy the system. Again, uh, glossing over a lot of details, you might have analytics, you might have logging, uh, you might have uh, fleet management, you'll have uh, uh, updates of your system over the life of your system. Uh, so there's a lot involved there. Uh, and, and the choices you've made all the way up till now will play very, very much into uh, your ability to do this successfully with your IoT designs. And I kind of lied. There is a step eight because uh, ultimately this is why we're here. We always want to uh, we, we want to make some some money off of this. So step eight is obviously once it's out there, uh, end users, consumers love our products, and they, they 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 rush to the stores to give us money for our products. So ultimately that's our goal. So. I, I ran briefly through what a build system is, but uh, let's dig into that. What exactly is a build system in this context? It's a mechanism to specify and build the software, the system software, all the way up to the application stack that runs on your embedded device. It may include the, the bootloader. Typically it will, uh, but uh, some designs it's going to be different. Uh, it, it has a mechanism to define the hardware in the BSP, uh, and, and it allows you to integrate your application, uh, any additional libraries, any additional custom code that may be provided by uh, your manufacturers or anything like that. Uh, the build system is going to give you a way to integrate that all in a, a well-defined workflow that allows you to easily and, and bring those components in, mush them all together into a, a single distribution or a, a single uh, binary that you're able to then deploy and provision to your devices. One important thing about a build system is it, it allows for easy reproducibility. This is one of the big differences between something like uh, a, the Octo build system and uh, starting with a Debian system where you log into the system and run apt get update and pull everything down. When you run a build with the Yocto build system, what you get at the end of the day is the fully functioning system. You don't then, necess you don't then expect to log into the system and uh, add extra packages in there. So you know that exactly what you have in your lab and your testing is what's going on your end user devices. So that reproducibility is, is very important. Uh, it also, because of that, allows you to support multiple developers. If you're dealing with a, a, a golden SD card image that uh, some developer in your lab has uh, installed everything on exactly as you need it, and then they back that card up and they hand that out to all the other developers, it, that, that adds a point uh, where things slow down because there's one or two developers in charge of that golden image, and every time you have an update, then you've got to get that pushed out to all your other developers. With, with, with a, a build system like Yocto, that's baked in to the workflow that is part of the, uh, of the build system. Uh, a couple nice to haves, it, it, it should allow for parallel processing in your build, that's pretty straight, straightforward, but uh, generally speaking, uh, the amount of code going in to build any one of these embedded Linux systems is staggering. It's just, you're building a lot of packages, it takes a lot of time, and if you're trying to do it without uh, running a lot of things in parallel, you're gonna uh, start your build, you know, go, go away for the weekend and uh, come back in a couple weeks and you'll be fine. Uh, but uh, the, 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 the more cores you can throw at it, the better. If you can throw more memory at it, even better. Uh, if you can go into a cloud-based uh, infrastructure, you can always uh, you know, go to the very biggest uh, uh, AMI instances that are out there and run it there. Uh, so that, that, that'll get you uh, speed in your build. build. Um, 
I mentioned cross-building early on as a typical workflow. The tool chains when you're talking about cross-building tend to be a pretty big pain point. If you've ever tried to build a tool chain and get all the libraries and all the components you need at the right versions and get them built and, and uh, staged together in the right uh, bootstrapping order, you understand how complicated that would be. Uh, fortunately, these days, there are a lot of choices where you can go get pre-built tool chains. Uh, all the build systems have their mechanism for building the tool chain, so that, that takes that pain away from you as the system developer. You don't have to worry about, okay, do I have the right versions? Are they going to play nice together? You, that's all integrated into the build system, and you don't have to, to spend any more time worrying about it. And finally, for some designs, license management is a very important consideration. Some designs, not so much, some, but uh, in some cases, you want to make sure there's no GPLv3, you want to make sure there's no proprietary code, whatever. Uh, the Yocto build system has a very good mechanism for uh, the, keeping track of the licenses, letting you exclude certain licenses, uh, having it throw errors if you pulled something in that pulled in a dependency you weren't expecting that may have uh, maybe pulled in something that's uh, questionable from a licensing standpoint. So that's all part of the build system. So what isn't a build system? The build system is not an IDE. Generally speaking, Yocto, you're not going to be developing your application in Yocto. Typically, you're going to build a, a base binary that you're running on your system, and then you use some kind of out-of-band mechanism, whether it's an Eclipse-based uh, system with a connection to your board or just you're just running Python code or whatever, but typically your actual day-to-day uh, uh, -day back and forth of uh, typical application development you don't do as part of Yocto. Yocto then acts as a packaging step once you have the base code uh, and you're ready to actually release it to the next step in your development pipeline. Uh, it's also not a distribution. Okay? It, Yocto focuses on mechanism, not policy. So they have sensible defaults so that you don't have to specify every little detail of your system to begin with. But if you want to change from, say, systemd to sysvnit or vice versa, that's easy to do. Whereas typically with things like Debian or Ubuntu, they tend to apply a lot more policy on top. And if it doesn't fit with your design, then you might be in uh, for uh, uh, so, some, uh, some pain to get that uh, addressed if you're using a, a system like that. It's also not a deployment and provisioning tool. And what I mean by that is once you have the images out of Yocto, typically it's a separate step to then get the images uh, from your build system to the device, whether it's uh, writing it to the SD card or using uh, some kind of uh, USB uh, system where the, the board is mounted as an OTG device and you're actually writing it uh, as if it were a block device on your system. Uh, those are typically going to be outside of the scope of Yocto, although in a lot of cases in the platform, uh, the BSP repositories you're looking at, they'll have instructions showing you how to do that, but uh, uh, like I say, it's typically a post-processing step. And finally, it's not an out-of-the-box solution. You're not going to go download Yocto, press, press run, and, and have, an, have a system doing everything you want it to do. The whole point of something like Yocto is the configurability it gives you and the ability to pick and choose uh, protocols, uh, application development environments, languages, everything you might need. You will have to do some customization and, and designing of your system through, through, uh, through the Yocto uh, workflows. So we've, we've, we've kind of talked around a lot of these things. The first the quote you see here at the top of the screen, it's not an embedded Linux distribution. It creates a custom one for you. That's a tagline directly from the Yocto Project's website. There, and, and that kind of goes back to what I was saying just a minute ago. It focuses on mechanism, not policy. Uh, there are, there is actually in Yocto, there is the concept of a distribution that you can specify as part of your configuration. So if you want the Angstrom distribution, that is a, 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 a packaging step in Yocto that brings together a number of policies and gives you a certain level of functionality. If you don't want that, you can specify others. So it, it gives you the ability to pick and choose at the very highest level of, of functionality in your system. What the Yocto project really is as, as, at its core is a collection of recipes, metadata, dependencies, and configuration. So recipes in this, in this case refer to what are the steps needed to build any given package. Uh, you know, we, we're, configure, make, make, install is the base, most basic, but there's all sorts of packages that use many different uh, uh, build and, and, and deploy methodologies. So that's all encoded in the Yocto recipes. Uh, metadata is just a general term that you set metadata for some of the selections you make in terms of the policies you want to implement for your design. You set, you, it's it's the, the data that goes into the build system that actually controls everything that, that, that the Yocto build is going to be doing for you. 
the dependencies amongst these packages get very hairy. And if you had to track that manually, you would, uh, again, not be very happy about it. Fortunately, Yaktu, the recipes specify automatically the dependencies that they have. So when you build a particular package, it knows whether it needs the, the C library or if it needs Python or a, a particular Python library. And the build system of Yocto called Bitbake pulls all that information together and is able to build a dependency graph and know exactly what needs to be, be built first, second, third, and it's able to actually scale that out to as much parallelism as you can throw at it and make sure that you're not running into issues where I'm ready to link something but I don't have the library to link it with. So that all that dependency tracking and scheduling is handled by the Bitbake uh, package manager that's, that's built into Yocto. Uh, and then just general configuration. You have configuration files at the, at the uh, BSP uh, layer that specify the, the, the chipset, the architecture, the instruction set. Uh, for your board, uh, you specify what bootloader, what version, things like that. So the, 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 the configuration in Yocto is extremely detailed and gives you very fine grain control uh, over, over the, the way your system is built. The primary output of a Yocto build is a package feed. And this is essentially a directory on your build system uh, that contains a, a whole boatload of uh, .rpm files or .deb files or .ipk files, depending on which uh, packaging choice you have made. Uh, it also has uh, the configuration to allow you to install those packages into an existing system if you so choose. Uh, so from that perspective, the output of your Yocto build can look much like a, a system, uh, your desktop system, where you can just run app get update and get new packages. That's great at development time. You probably want to turn that off before you deploy the thing. Um, the secondary output of your Yocto build is the actual boot images. Now, in practice, uh, for the, the, the level of work I do, I don't deal with the package feeds all that much. I use it mostly to get those boot images. That's typically going to be your root file system, your kernel, your bootloader, and any other subsequent images you need to actually get a fully functioning system running with, with, with the output of your build. Uh, it's important to note that uh, everything in Yocto is built from source. That's the, that is the methodology. Um, now, there are some things like firmware binary blobs, obviously, that uh, aren't really built from source. But uh, ultimately, if it's possible for the Yocto system to build something from source, that is the preferred mechanism to do it. Uh, and I mentioned mechanism, not policy, but I want to mention it again because it's very, it, that, that's a very key portion of uh, a system like this. Um, and then again, the, the main products, that root file system image, kernel bootloader, uh, the tool chain is there, uh, which is nice because then you can hand the tool chain off to your application developers and they're able to actually cross compile their code. So the, the, the Yocto project is organized into, it, it's got a very uh, regimented layering structure and this is how we get a lot of, uh, a lot of good, good functionality. The base layers, have the minimum necessary to bring a system up and running. If you go to and, and check out the, the, the base Yocto layers, the only platforms that exist in those, in those layers are, there's I think the BeagleBone, Black, and then a couple of emulated platforms. So typically your platform support is going to be handled in a separate layer. Uh, there's a lot of functionality uh, at higher levels. There's graphics stacks, there's things like QT. Uh, we'll get into some of the IoT specific <coughs> stuff in a, in a couple of slides. But the idea is to separate that functionality out into logical blocks that you can pull together based on the specific needs of your system. Uh, so you're going to start with a platform uh, or a machine BSP of some kind. You bring in the Yocto base layers, and then you might, uh, if you need QT, you'll bring in those layers. If you need some of the IoT uh, specific protocols, you'll be pulling those things in. It allows these uh, systems to uh, progress at their own rate. Some of them have uh, less developers. They may not, uh, they may not be doing uh, point releases at the same pace that the, the Octo project is doing. Uh, so it, it allows the project to, to or each of these individual layers to proceed at their own pace. Um, additionally, there's an SDK mechanism. I mentioned that the tool chain is an output of the build. In addition to that, you can actually package up libraries, header files, and everything needed for application developers so that you can give them a separate, separate package that they're able to use and your, the, your application developers will not need to 
uh, get involved with the full Yocto uh, system level builds. That uh, makes things a lot easier for them. You can, you know, as the system developer, I, I can have a policy of I publish a new SDK every week, every month, whatever is appropriate. My application developers know that then they can come in and get the very latest in their building against something that has been at least tested to some level by me, and then they don't have to deal with all the uh, details of understanding how to do Yocto project builds. Um, some of the optimizations that are built in, uh, parallel builds, I mentioned that, that's very important. Uh, Yocto also has a, a mechanism called shared state, and this is basically caching the intermediate steps of each of the packages that you're building, all the, all the, uh, the tasks that go into building a particular package, the intermediate product at, at each point can be packaged off as a shared state and reused. So that means if I'm building BusyBox, the first time I build it, yeah, it's going to build it from source and then it's going to save off uh, the, it's going to save off the original source, it's going to save off the patched source, it's going to save off uh, the, uh, the output of uh, the configure step and the make step and the make install step. So that the next time I come back and build, if the configuration has not changed such, such that it would affect any of those pieces of output, then it can just reuse that, that cache data that it's already saved. And that's a great time saver. Uh, if you have a, a continuous integration system, you take the shared state output from your, your nightly CI builds and you export that over just a, uh, a, a web URI and then all your individual developers can point at that so that if they're using the same exact thing, it, cut, it's, it, it cuts down their development time quite a bit. So if you haven't looked into the shared state and specifically the shared state mirrors with your Yocto development, I, I, I highly encourage you to do so. It will save a lot of time. So in general, getting started with Yocto, I think based on the number of folks uh, that, that, that have already worked with Yocto, this is probably old hat, but uh, uh, these four commands are enough to uh, check out the basic system from the Yocto project, Git uh, repository, uh, and then run a build for an emulated x86 platform and invoke it. You're not going to do a whole lot with this. Uh, it, it will uh, launch a terminal window, as you see here. Uh, but this, the, the, this set of state, statements is a you know, copy and paste way of getting something up and running if, if you're unfamiliar with it and you want to kind of get a feel for the workflow. So uh, this is a, you know, the, 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 the emulator integration into, into Yocto is very good and it's useful for a lot of things. Uh, so uh, again, that's something else you might want to look at if you haven't spent uh, much time looking at that before. So we can kind of step back and talk about why Linux for embedded. Uh, so a little bit of the, the, the higher level. I think uh, most of this should be review for all of us. Uh, obviously, Linux is everywhere. There's a lot of uh, available software out there. Uh, you know, on your Linux system, you can run just about every network protocol ever conceived. Uh, there's a lot of Linux expertise, as can be uh, gathered from the number of folks at this conference. Uh, plenty of training materials, that kind of thing. So if you're having a hard time uh, convincing your management, uh, you know, that's kind of what these slides are for. Broad device support. Again, Linux probably supports more chipsets and things like that uh, than, than just about any system out there. Uh, and it, it gives you a very common system architecture on both uh, your build host and your target, which is very useful. Uh, speeds up your developers' times. They don't have to spend a whole lot of time learning new systems. Uh, and it's open source. If that's uh, important for your design, obviously, uh, that's, that's just one thing to keep in mind. Uh, industry support. There's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of industry trade groups and that kind of thing. Uh, there's Geneva and AGL in the automotive space. Obviously, there's the Linux Foundation uh, and things like that. So there's just a lot of activity in the Linux space. And uh, you know, this, this, like I say, these slides are generally for those that have a hard time convincing their management that this is something they want to contend with. But I suspect uh, we can kind of get past most of that here. So specifically about Yocto and IoT, I uh, just wanted to go uh, for a few minutes now and kind of talk uh, a little bit more about that. Uh, generally speaking, Yocto is very well supported by most of the semiconductor vendors and the, the board manufacturers. So chances are, if you're looking at a board uh, for an IoT design, uh, chances are your vendor already has some level of support for, in, for a Yocto layer for that board. Um, it, it does have a very well-defined workflow. Once you get into Yocto, it's very similar from, from system to system. So once you know it for one system, you, you know the basics for what you need to do if it, when you're ready to move on to the next design. Um, because of the reproducibility of these builds and the fact that you're not dealing with a single golden image that one person has the right to update, it does support large developer teams very well. 
I can add things in my local configuration when I'm ready. I push them up to my Git repos, and the other developers on my team can then sync with that, pull it down, they do the build. Now they have a matching image on their system. So it works very well for that. It does, there is very easy access to IO, IoT specific protocols, and I, I've got a few examples of that in a minute, but uh, basically the, the layering mechanism that I mentioned uh, makes it very easy for these things to be packaged up and stored and, and accessed in any given design. Uh, and it does have very good connectivity and coexistence with uh, the, the RTOSs. In the IoT space, a lot of times we're dealing with uh, multi-node systems. We might be dealing, uh, we might have Linux on some of the nodes, and we might be running free RTOS or uh, Zephyr or something on a, on a smaller MCU-based design. Uh, so it's good to know that uh, there's a lot of collaboration in those communities and, and that these things work very well together. And another uh, very critical, important update, uh, the thing to mention is that the Upstream Yocto project has a very regimented release cycle. They do keep up to date with the, any of the critical vulnerabilities that are, that are out there. So if you're using a Yocto stable branch, you get a lot of that, that uh, in your design you're able to pull from without having to do a whole lot of extra work. So you, you get to reuse a lot of the work that the, the folks at the Yocto project are doing to maintain uh, the stable branches over the lifetime of your project. So I mentioned uh, IoT specific protocols. Uh, I assume uh, some of these on, the, uh, on this list uh, many of you are familiar with. Things like MQTT, uh, there's a package in, in one of the Yocto layers called Python Paho MQTT, which is just the Python implementation. It's very easy to use, uh, very easy to add to your system. Uh, that's actually in one of the, the, the core open embedded layers. Uh, AMQP is implemented by RabbitMQ. I don't believe that's one of the core Yocto layers, but uh, it is, uh, there is uh, a, uh, a thing called the Yocto layer index that pulls all this information together. Uh, and then uh, other things that are used, CoAP, uh, ZeroMQ, GPS, uh, Bluetooth obviously is uh, pretty widely used in the, in the IoT space. So all of these kind of protocols are very well supported uh, in, in the Active Project and it's uh, usually just a, a, a few minor steps to get those things pulled into your design and into your configuration. Um, networking, there's quite a few uh, choices uh, for uh, network management, obviously uh, keeping track of Wi-Fi, uh, SSIDs and passwords uh, is kind of, can, can be tricky. Systemd networking is uh, a, a mode, of, a component of Systemd that's built in. That's fairly easy to use. If you want something more full featured, then there's things like Conman, which is used pretty extensively in the automotive space. Uh, and the network manager, uh, which uh, I know is uh, part of uh, my Ubuntu desktop. Uh, so that, you know, those kinds of things are also available. You can switch between one or the other depending on your specific needs. Um, and finally, moving up the stack to your application developers, uh, Python and Node.js seem to be the most commonly used application frameworks for IoT designs, uh, and, and they are very well supported. The, the, they have layers with, with uh, the base uh, language support as well as uh, many supplemental libraries and that kind of thing. So it, it's very easy to, to, to get the uh, libraries and languages supported that are needed for your application developers as well. And this is a, 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 a screenshot from the uh, Yocto layer index that I mentioned. You probably can't read it very well. Uh, the source at the bottom of the screen is actually the, the direct link to the, the, the layer index. And all I did here was uh, search for the, the term IoT, and you see there's quite a few layers here that contain components related to IoT. Um, a, a, another interesting search was cloud. I found a, a, a number of components uh, for accessing uh, some of the commercial cloud providers like Azure or AWS or uh, Google Cloud or, or some of those. There's a lot, there's a lot of integration with, uh, with those providers already built in uh, to the Yocto layers. So it really does give you a leg up in getting your system designed up and, and running very quickly. So just to kind of sum up uh, why Yocto for uh, IoT designs, uh, it's very widely supported. Chances are uh, any, any board uh, semiconductor that you're looking at already has some level of support in the Yocto project. Has a very active developer community keeping track of uh, security updates and that kind of thing, which uh, isolates you from a, a lot of extra activities. Uh, and the, the, the layering mechanism, uh, I can't overstate how important that is in Yocto. That is one of the, the, the key core components of, a, of any Yocto project design. Uh, making it extremely customizable, extremely enhanceable, very easy to configure for your particular uh, use case. 
Uh, it does rely on minimum native tooling, which makes it very easy uh, to run on a wide variety of uh, desktop uh, PC operating systems. Uh, I, I generally use Ubuntu, but it, uh, typically if uh, Yocto needs a particular package as part of the build time, it's going gonna, it's gonna to build it itself. So you know that it, it all works very well together and it's very easy to deploy to whatever uh, distribution your developers may like. Uh, and, and finally, uh, I do want to mention one more time the, the ability to predict the exact software contents. If you have a system in the field where the end user is able to install new packages, it makes it very difficult to know exactly what's on the device, know that, that you've tested every possible combination. Uh, if, if, you don't, if you use something like Yocto, it gives you a very good starting point to know exactly that what I'm testing in my lab is exactly what's going out to the end user. There's no, uh, I don't have to worry that uh, a distribution provider may have pushed an update that my end users end up pulling that is not good. So that, that, that's a very important thing. A uh, couple of downsides, it has a pretty steep learning curve. Those of you that have already gone through the learning curve probably uh, are familiar with that. Uh, it, it is a, a pretty unfamiliar environment uh, to non-embedded developers, uh, especially in the uh, IoT space. We see a lot more uh, folks with uh, web and UI UX experience coming into the IoT space wanting to learn how to, to design these systems. Uh, and you know the whole, the whole idea of cross-building and things like that, that's very foreign to them. So uh, that's definitely one of the downsides. Uh, and it's very resource intensive. These builds take a long time. They're going to require a lot of disk space. Uh, when you're starting from scratch, you're looking at, uh, depending on the configuration, anywhere from an hour to you know, six to eight hours, depending on the, the strength and uh, power of your machine, and possibly multiple gig gigabytes of space. So uh, this is not something you're going to run in a Chromebook uh, you know, in a half hour while you're at lunch. So I would uh, encourage you to keep that in mind. So with that, I got a couple resources here, uh, and we definitely have time for some questions, I believe. Uh, so the, the first link here was a talk I gave last year that goes in a, uh, a bit more depth uh, on this topic, comparing build, the, the Yocto to other uh, build systems, uh, and giving you a little bit more comparison there. Uh, the, the second link is actually the article that I wrote that led to this talk, so it goes into a little bit more depth about this specific topic. And the, and the last link there is kind of a, a next step up from that getting started page that I had that will actually walk you through uh, in, in uh, less than a half a dozen copy and paste steps, getting started uh, doing a build of Yocto for a Raspberry Pi 3. Uh, and uh, in a self-serving fashion, it also happens to be uh, running the Mender Updater. Uh, so at that point, then you actually are able to, to update your device over the air. So uh, I would encourage you to take a look at those links. Uh, ways to get in touch with me, obviously, down at the bottom. Uh, I'd love to hear from you. If you have any questions, uh, we'll certainly take them now. Uh, and if you have any uh, thoughts or anything you'd like to share afterwards, uh, there's plenty of ways to get in touch with me. Of course, all the way in the back corner is the first question every time, isn't it? Thank you. Can you pass that down for me, please? Uh, what is your p opinion to use uh, Yocto on a real server? Uh, in, in, in what sense? To actually you generate the code for your server? No, to use Yocto as a distribution for on a real hardware server. So uh, DNS, uh, DNS server, NFS server, uh, FTP I, server, all that. I assume all those things are supported. It's not something I've ever looked at doing. Uh, but uh, with the amount of functionality that's available in the various uh, community layers, I'd be very surprised if that wasn't feasible. Uh, but it's, it hasn't been my focus because my focus is generally on, on the embedded client side of things. Yeah, I missed the talk earlier about comparing Yocto to build root, but could you elaborate just the bullet points from that perhaps, or if, if that if you could tell me if that link answered that question. Uh, well, that link definitely will answer that question. That was the talk I gave at uh, ELC Portland. But uh, at, at a high level, they both, they both solve the same problem. So ultimately, they both are trying to, they're both very similar at the very highest level. It's really in the details. Um, one thing that BuildRoot doesn't do is it doesn't have the concept of a package feed. So BuildRoot itself produces the, produces the binary that you run on your target, but there's no, there, there's no concept of now I have a package for something that I can uh, install later on. So that's one of the big differences. BuildRoot is focused on simplicity. Uh, it's, it, it has a lower learning curve, generally speaking, than Yocto. 
Um, out of the box, the build configurations uh, are going to have just about everything turned off, whereas in Yocto, the, the, they have more uh, defaults that are turned on. Uh, and so uh, in build root, generally, you're going you're, you're to start with a much more minimal system and then have to build up from there. So, uh, but it, it, it's really an Emacs versus VI uh, this discussion. Uh, they, they both have their pluses and minuses, and they both have uh, plenty of uh, people using them in active communities. So uh, I would encourage you to check out, uh, check out both of them for sure. Thanks. All right, anybody else? All right, thank you very much. Let's all go home.